one of the things that Sam brought up on the episode with me was his infamous Twitter clip with you. Mm. What was the experience of that particular 180 seconds catching fire like? You know, I felt terrible when that happened. Really, really terrible. Because I've never been on the end of a Twitter shitstorm to that extent. But it it's not pleasant. No matter how strong-minded you are, whatever, there's a reason that Rogan always says, don't read the comments, right? Like uh, like the great man Joseph Stalin says, quantity has a quality all of its own. So there's only a certain number of negative comments you can ignore until just the volume of shit becomes overwhelming. So my primary concern, actually, not I don't know Sam well, but uh, was for his well-being, actually. I just I just worried how he would experience that more than anything. That was my concern because our approach is always about giving a guest an opportunity to reveal themselves in the best light possible. And for some people, that light shines very brightly and can burn. Um, but that's not our intention. We never go into an interview with the desire to out somebody or expose somebody. It's not a gotcha. It's not a gotcha. So I was worried about him and i emailed him straight away just to you know check up on him and and you know also we didn't put that clip out we could have done because we obviously understood that it was a controversial thing he said and actually uh, most people don't know this but that was not the most controversial thing he said in that interview in my opinion we talked about covid on locals which was the paywall section of the interview and what he said there i found quite what did he say i don't remember the wording and people will have to go and watch it but it was you know i came away from that thinking that you know, he's overestimating the threat and as a result of that is prepared to do some pretty drastic things mm. or or demand drastic things to be done. Um, so first and foremost, as somebody who interviews people for a living, I was concerned for him. But I also felt that, you know, what he said was wrong. I didn't agree with it. Um, and I, 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 my view on it is that if you overestimate the nature of the threat, all else follows. And I think on Trump and COVID, that that is where Sam, in my opinion, is 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 well. That's why he's doing what he's doing and saying what he's saying. Because if I thought Trump was as bad as Tr Sam thinks, it'd be very tempting to think along the lines that Sam thinks along. And likewise with COVID, if I thought this was like Ebola that spreads, mm -hmm. I'd also be. You know, we should also be honest, you know, the conversation people are like, well, there's never, ever, ever any reason for the government to mandate vaccines. And I broadly agree with that, unless the disease is really like dangerous yeah. and deadly. I, mean, I, I said this at the beginning of COVID, like imagine that the disease had a 100% mortality rate for all women, or it was a 100% mortality rate for all people under the age of 10. There'd be some people who'd support it. <laughs> well, yeah, but I, I think that the the... Fundamentally, it came down to a risk and reward yeah. equation. And yeah. most people considered that the risk of getting COVID was not greater than the risk of either getting the vaccine or of opening up mandated vaccines as a pathway overall, yes. right? And it's just, where do you sit on this mm. equation? There's lots of other things, but broadly, I think it's where do you sit on this equation? And Sam, I completely agree with him that I think COVID as an event was like the worst kind of vaccine that we could have given our epidemiology, our medical system, the view of vaccines overall. Vaccine skepticism at large, I bet, has gone through the fucking roof. It has. It has. Have you had a look at this? Yeah, of course it has. I know anecdotally, just speaking to people, how much that's, that, that's the case. Yeah. yeah. So if we are to have something that comes around the next time and it does kill fucking all children under 10 or all women or whatever the fuck, it's got some incubation period of 28 days and a mortality of 40%. It's just a PSYOP. It's mm. another PSYOP. This mm. is Klaus Schwab doing it again. This is the WEF. Mm. And it's like, oh God, like that's, that's it literally would have been better if COVID hadn't happened, right? Yeah, sure enough, we can get masks out of the way more quickly and we've got like some, some inefficiency in the, in the system were opened up. But if you were to look at COVID as a like operational logistical vaccine, our response to it failed us way worse than if we'd never got it at all. And we got a vaccine injury from COVID. Yes, yes, we did. And and I also think the one thing that is sort of inexplicably neglected in all of this is 
I'd really like to know where COVID came from. I'd really like to know. Don't you think that's important? Don't you think we should know where it came from? Because there are some credible assertions about its origins that would suggest that we may have another pandemic soon. Um, Is that right? I haven't seen this. Well, if this came from a lab in Wuhan because of -of gain-of-function research, and we are not willing to be honest about that, and gain-of-function research continues... Mm. Why wouldn't we have another pandemic? I never looked into this much. I know that uh, Sam had Matt Ridley and somebody else, somebody else on his show. We've had Matt on to talk about this as well. Okay, cool. Yeah, and the truth is, we don't know. Yeah. Uh, but I, I'm using the kind of the smell test here because I grew up in a in a in a communist society, um, and what communist societies do when there is something, and all societies do this to a large extent because people don't like to to expose their own flaws and. No one wants to be like, oh, I was responsible for killing millions of people, you know. But they will cover it up in a way that, you know, that is proper. And Matt actually gave this example of there was a leak somewhere in the Soviet Union, which was a radioactive leak, I think, or maybe it was a biological. uh, And they covered up for ages. And then, you know, when the Soviet Union collapsed, we finally found out, no, no, it was actually a leak. So if this is a product of... Uh, gain of function research getting out into the real world, which is credible. That there's there's very credible assertions about that. The world needs to know, and this type of research needs to end. But if we are unwilling to have that conversation honestly and do the proper investigations, which would be difficult because the CCP wouldn't want that. And on top of that, you've got all this other bullshit about how it's racist and all of that. Uh, we've got a problem. So the I, I think my worry with everything that's happened with COVID is. Not only have we not learned the lessons, I feel like, like you said, we've got a vaccine injury from the experience Mm -hmm. and everyone is sort of stuck in their corner. And like Sam said to you, everyone's got their own facts about it now. Correct. Yeah. Um, that's That's a problem. It's interesting what you said about the felt sense of being in the blast radius of Sam's online experience. Mm. I noticed it is someone called it Sam Harris's World Embarrassment Tour because he did my show, he did Stephen's show, and he did Tom Billu's show. And I don't know, man, like, there seems to be something, it's almost like there was resentment sat on the internet, latent resentment sat on the internet waiting for Sam to fuck up. And then he did a thing, oh, maybe maybe it's right. I, I maybe. don't think it was personal. It, that was my the reason I paused there. I don't mm. think it was personal to Sam. I think, particularly on his Trump comments, there are a lot of people who were like, this is what we always knew the Trump haters think deep inside. And mm. Sam was willing to vocalize it, which is, I don't care how big the transgressions are on the other side. I don't care what Hunter Biden has done. I don't care what Joe Biden has done. No matter what they do, it can never be as bad as Orange Man bad. And that's sort of how he came across. And so the people who who felt gaslit this entire time about, uh, you know, the overestimation of the threat of Trump, they they were vindicated in that moment. And I think Sam just caught him, was caught in the rage yeah. of people yeah, feeling like- the, the Kind of like the perfect timed storm yes. with the perfect pebble in the perfect river that directed it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's so interesting, man. You know, we I, I had this conversation with <laughs> a, a fitness influencer called Sarah Safari in LA a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I'd be interested to get your thoughts on this. I think it's analogous to the Sam situation. A lot of people, especially right of center, say things like, you can't judge somebody on just one thing that they say. Yet, when it came to a six pack of Bud Light being sent to Dylan Mulvaney by some marketing intern somewhere deep in the annals of the Anheuser-Busch thing, or Miller Light release one video the Miller Lite thing felt a little bit more produced it's probably gone through a few more layers but largely I just wondered I thought it was interesting that the charity that a lot of people right of center ask to be given to their commentators or you know their champions that are canceled for taken out of context points there was that uh Roseanne Barr bit with Theo Vaughn where she made a joke about the Jews which was the most egregious clipping that I've ever seen from anything ever the end of a three minute long bit 
and they took the final 30 seconds and put it up as if it was representative of the whole thing. It was so fucking bad. But I did notice nobody decided to use that same idea about, well, hang on a second, maybe maybe this is just one small department in one small corner of one small brand's marketing push. And they gave this person, who is very unpopular on the internet, a six-pack of Bud Light. And before you know it, Kid Rock's got an AR-15 pointed at a few cases of your drink. What do you think about so I th- uh, I would uh, separate those two out. Uh, so Sam, I think, is that point applies very much. And this is what the angle I'm coming from. And I felt that while I strongly disagree with, with what he said, I think that was clear in the interview, um, he has enough credit in the bank with me that I'm willing to have a lot of understanding and a lot of grace with him. And I, I like, and I, what I would say as well is, you know, we were having a lot of tech issues on the day that we interviewed Sam and he sat there for like a good hour while we were trying to scrambling to get the microphones to work. And he was the most decent human being that we've had on the show. In, in, you see in who respect. someone really is when the cameras aren't rolling. That seemed to me like a really important thing that other people obviously wouldn't have seen. So um, I have a lot of time for Sam uh, and respect for him. I, I don't have the same relationship with Dylan Mulvaney. <laughs> <laughs> and I also think you haven't taken a world of wisdom from Dylan Mulvaney over the last. You'd be few... surprised, man. Oh, okay. You'd be surprised. And so um, I think, look, Dylan Mulvaney is a symbol in to many people. Like Sam is a symbol to many people for, for different things. But I, I think it's a slightly different issue because you. I don't know if you saw, but immediately after the the Dylan Mulvaney controversy, the marketing executive who was responsible for this. There was there was a video of her talking to I think a reporter about the thinking behind what the idea there was. So it seemed a little bit more thought out. And it was contrived. thought out, and her her angle was our our customers are shit. That was her angle. Our shit. Yeah. What's it, a shit customer? Well, uh, it was just uh, it's just these guys who've got like a you know old fashioned sense of humor, and they don't. You, like, do you know what I mean? Like we're going to educate our customers and i'm like you sell beer that's not your job sell them the fucking beer and shut up yeah right um and look the trans issue for reasons that i actually think are quite understandable and obvious is the lightning rod of our time um so i'm not surprised that that caused the reaction that it did and uh, and i understand it i i i do think and i said i wrote a Substack on this at the time um uh, that perhaps the giving so much attention to it is what prompts these brands to to go down this route. Hmm. Obviously, with Dylan Mulvaney, it backfired mm-hmm. for sure. It's a roll of the dice for attention. It's a roll of the dice for attention that I don't think they'd consider. And I think that executive ended up being fired. I do understand why people got as fired up about it as, as they did, because you're rewarding behavior that a lot of people would feel is the wrong behavior to reward in the public eye. Dylan Mulvaney. Mm-hmm. But that woman is... One lady, maybe maybe in her interview with the reporter, she said this went all the way up and the director, see the fucking chief marketing officer or whatever was involved in this. But if it wasn't the case, I don't think, if, if it turned out that it was one small group in, in the corner, as I like guessed or whatever, I don't think that the internet would have given Bud Light any more leeway. I don't mm. think they would have said, we need to separate the art and the artist here. You know, they've made beer for three decades for however fucking long it's been around and maybe maybe it's right maybe it it shows their woke bona fides it shows that they're the man hating like left leaning blue head cucks that they always were but i don't know like it seems like a lot of the time people want it's a it's a smart idea to be able to say uh, rogan has been in a few controversies over the last few years most people said i have faith you're telling me this is the tip of the iceberg. I've seen the whole iceberg, right? I know that there is nothing lurking deep down in the depths. Massive advantage he has is he's published like 5,000 hours of content over the last decade, Mm -hmm. which means that you have a pretty good body of evidence that sits on the other side of the scale. Bud Light, you don't know much about what's going on inside of the marketing department, but I just thought it was interesting. I thought that maybe this is a time where it would be illustrative and you should be careful about... Transge- transgressing rules that you want to be enforced. So mm. if you want the don't judge somebody by one single occurrence rule to be enforced, and then you don't enforce it, that, as you said before, that tit-for-tat game, it opens up, well, they did it, 
So it's just playground mentality. I understand what you mean, but I think I disagree, actually. I think the reason that people uh, were as upset about as they are is, while it's these are different companies, the sense is, imagine it wasn't just Rogan who said something, but it was Chris Williamson and Trigonometry and all the other podcasters who do what we do, all at one point said the same thing. And then there was yet another example of a podcaster uh, saying it. So I when you see. look at the Gillette Matt toxic masculinity ad. If you look at all the other instances where corporations put pride flags, or they replace their brand but with not pride. in the Middle East. Not well, obviously not. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> do they uh, do it in Russia? They can't do it in Russia. I either. doubt it. I doubt it. I can't imagine why. In Mother Russia, gay has you. Yeah, exactly. So I think what people felt was here again. We've got a corporation just absolutely taking the piss, lecturing the ordinary public, and thrusting these very niche issues onto what is a very, very, like, normal household beer. And you just can't escape this shit. Yeah. That's what I think people so feel. it's kind of a straw that broke the camel's back. Of I just agree. Big yeah. corporation overall. That's interesting. Because what I was doing was I was taking Bud Light as a individual instance on its yes. own. What you're saying is this is more endemic of a broader trend among big corporations. Well, broadly speaking, if you think about what the anti-woke narrative is the anti-woke narrative is and i agree with very large parts of it is that most of the major institutions whether that be media whether that be the civil service whether that be uh, the political systems the parties the uh, the corporations the education system they've all been captured or corrupted uh, or through some other mechanism become uh, the projectors of a certain worldview onto the public who do not share that worldview and so when you see the toxic masculinity Gillette ad, which is like, hey, you know, you, you're, you're a man, you're a piece of shit, buy a razor. You, you, <laughs> you know, hey, you're a piece of shit, buy our beer, yeah. etc. cetera. It, it sort of builds up to a point like, why is everyone telling me I'm a piece of shit? Um, and it gets old. And, you know, it, and I actually, you know, particularly this anti-masculinity anti narrative that you see everywhere, in movies, uh, in advertising, in in all sorts of different genres, uh, I think it's really, really dangerous because if you think about Gillette ads in the 90s, you were a bit younger than me. I don't know if you remember them. Mm -hmm. But they the were... The best a man can get. And it's like some blonde hot chick in like a whatever. She's like draped actually, on the shoulder. Actually, that wasn't the 90s Gillette ads. The okay. 90s Gillette ads were a bunch of men being healthy masculinity. It was... Uh, a man putting his tie on as he holds his baby up before he's going to work. He was a man uh, hugging his son on his way to his wedding. He was a man protecting his wife or, you know, it was a, it was a healthy view of men and relationships and men and women and so on. Um, and I always, I sort of say, you know, healthy masculinity is the 90s Gillette ads. That's what it looks like. Mm. Uh, men being responsible, men in relationships with women being respectful, being kind, but also being strong, looking after their children, teaching younger versions of men how to be men, et cetera, right? Um, and I understand why people, men and women, are fucking tired, really, really tired of this idea that men are bad and evil. Like my wife who is complete, I always say my wife is completely apolitical and as a result of that, extremely based, <laughs> right? Like she hates this shit. And I can't tell you how many women I speak to who are very, very tired of men being demonized in this way. And so am I. Well, especially given that a lot of those women will have sons. And they want their partner to be good and healthy. They don't want them to be feeble. You know, um, so I actually, I understand the pushback against that. I really do. And I think it's necessary. This episode is brought to you by Shortform. Shortform is my absolute favorite way to discover new nonfiction books and gain deeper insights into books that I've already read. You guys know about how important my reading list is to me, and Shortform is an easier, faster, and cheaper way to dive into ideas that I've always been curious about. They're essentially book summaries on steroids. They provide super detailed guides of the book's key ideas, and they've got smart insights and interactive exercises. I really love using Shortform to revisit some of my all-time favorite books, like The 48 Laws of Power by Robert Greene. They've got one-page summaries and breakdowns of each chapter that will help you to better absorb and solidify all of the learnings without having to go 
go back through a book that you've already read. The best part is that they always keep their library fresh. Short form drops new book guides and articles every week and subscribers get to vote on what books to cover. You can try short form completely free for five days with no obligation by following the link in the description or by going to shortform.com slash modern wisdom and you'll get an additional 20% off if you sign up for the annual subscription. That's shortform.com slash modern wisdom. Thank you very much for tuning in. If you enjoyed that clip, then press here for the full length two hour plus podcast with Constantine.